Hi, welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. Now, if you're listening to this, you may be leading self, leading others, or leading your organization. But as a leader, you've got to be accountable for change. Be the problem solver, not the problem admirer. But you've got to be the change in constant change, and sometimes you've got to break the status quo. So you do not want to miss this episode. Come back to me where I'll be joined by Chris Dorr, QC, Queen's Council. Also broadcaster, corporate advisor, and non-exec director. Join me just after this. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. Hey, Chris, and welcome to the Leadership Enigma. It's good to see you. Hi, good, good afternoon, Adam. I'm looking forward to it. This should be fun. I have been looking forward to this episode for sure. Now, Chris Dorr, QC, Queen's Council, help people understand what do we mean by Queen's Council? Well, Queen's Council is a kind of lawyer in England and uh, and, and the UK generally, um, where you, you, are, you once you reach a certain level of seniority in the profession, you have a sort of experience of doing the really big, the more complicated and difficult cases, usually around about 20 years into your career, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, yep. you can make an application um, to, to be called a QC or Queen's Council, which has been around for several hundred years. And, and basically, it's just a badge of excellence. It shows that you've been through a really uh, difficult and competitive application process that takes about a year, where they look over cases that you've done several years before that, where they speak to all the judges that you've appeared in front of and other QCs, lawyers as well. And they take a large number of references, there's interviews, etc. And at the end of it, you have the right to, to use the initials QC after your name. And, and it enables people to identify that, you, that you've reached that level in your career and that, you know, that there should be a high level of confidence that you know what you're doing. And as I say, it's nice to have a fellow barrister on the show and help people understand the nature of the work that you do. Because a barrister, trial lawyer, for those who are international listeners, it's the lawyers with the wig and the gown on. Uh, but really, it really is uh, the portfolio of work that you have. My, my practice is incredibly diverse, Adam. So I do everything from sort of international sort of corporate sort of cases, usually involving some degree of kind of criminal behavior or fraudulent behavior or breaking sort of international regulations or international law in some way. Um, right down to, you know, I still represent sort of footballers and celebrities who might find themselves in trouble in the in the criminal courts. I advise people who, you know, may have been the victims of some sort of you know, phone hacking or other forms of criminal activity against them. And they're looking to try and find, you know, a way to, 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 to preserve their position or even, even if sometimes to prosecute those who have committed crimes against them. So the, the, the theme that runs through it all is some element of, of criminal law or, or, or breaches of professional rules. I often represent very senior police officers, chief constables even, if, if they're in trouble themselves. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, the, the key theme, I think, is if someone's in the shit, my job is to try and get them out of it. Uh, and if someone's kind of having a major problem with someone else, they've been defrauded or something like that, is to try and help them get their money back. You know, Chris, I've been watching too much television. I'm starting to think of the equalizer when you describe it in that way, which is great. Well, Maybe that, who knows? It, you know? Um, I, 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 I wish we could always equalize for everyone. Sadly, it's not always possible. But um, but yeah, there's definitely an element of my career where people come to me for one most important thing, I think, which is that they've got a real big problem in their life, a legal problem of some sort, and they just want it solved. And, and I, I guess part of the theme of your uh, podcast around leadership and so on, you know, one of the other ways in which QCs or Queen's Council are described is as leading counsel. And, that, and, and yeah. you know, we are brought into cases because we have that sort of leadership quality about us, the ability to perhaps just apply a, a really strong sort of helicopter view of a situation and, and apply our kind of considerable experience of judgment to, um, to, to a range of problems. Um, and, and hopefully find some answers uh, for the client um, more quickly or with a more kind of slightly more um, uh, creative strategy than, than perhaps others may employ. 
So Chris, you're right at the heart of some of the biggest challenges that society may face in uh, the way that you represent uh, prosecuting and defending. I'm sure you do, you have done a bit of both. When we talk about breaking the status quo, what do you mean by breaking the status quo? Well, every time I look at a case, if you're talking about my legal practice, every yeah. time I look at a case, I, I don't look at it as uh, in the way that perhaps I did 20 or 25 years ago. And I started out almost 30 years ago. And, and, and when I started out, you kind of just look at it on, on the basis of what's in front of you. Here's the evidence. Here's the, you know, the, the, the case that I'm presented with. And, and, I, and you just go through a, a process, which yeah. is kind of an established process that you've been taught or which you may have you know, built up an established habit around. I think what I've started to do as I become more experienced and take on more of a leadership role in cases over the last decade or so is, is, is start to say to myself, OK, let's forget the norm normal standard way of doing this case how do we reach the point where the client gets the thing they want so that may involve litigating in a, in a conventional way or it may involve finding some sort of more creative solution to the legal problem trying to do a deal for example whether it be a sort of commercial or civil type deal or whether it be a deal with prosecutors and you know often I'm involved in cases of you know large-scale tax avoidance or tax ev evasion and and the cases that kind of fall somewhere on the on, on the slightly difficult line between the too and, and in many of those cases it involves kind of having to uh, advise clients to they're going to have to pay some money to make the problem go away if they don't want to go to jail so it's looking at kind of not just dealing with the case in the way that someone else has presented it to me but but what can i do that might be creative and different that might get them a better outcome more quickly and with less risk and less cost so Chris, this is incredibly important to anyone in a leadership position, whether they're, they're new in role, uh, they're an entrepreneur, whether they're a seasoned executive. And I'm going to come back to that point and, and I'm going to ask you to help me transfer some of what you've learned and you've practiced uh, to leadership generally. But I want to get to the heart. There's something driving you here because I know that you've done uh, a lot of broadcast work with TV. So you did the program on social mobility. I think it was Raising the Bar. Uh, I know you did uh, Are We Tough Enough? Or That's on BBC iPlayer with my friend yeah. Naz, and that was yeah. looking at the, the justice system. And also your book, and that's Justice on Trial, which is radical solutions for a system at breaking point. So something's driving you, Chris, in relation to being insatiably curious about some of these critical themes. What's behind that? I think what, what I've been asked that question. I think the answer is that, that about 10 years ago, which is around about the time that I was making my application to become a QC or, or to take silk, as, as we also call it. Yeah. I, 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 at that point in time, probably around about that time or just afterwards, I started to really analyze my cases more carefully. And because you have to, as part of the application process, you have to look at what you did, what you brought to the case, what, yep. you know, what, what it was that was particularly significant or special. And you have to be able to kind of extract that from often really complex cases that may have lasted several years. And so over, over the sort of course of a couple of years or so, I started to, to realize that many of the cases in which I've involved, uh, I'm involved, in fact, the, the, they don't really make sense. There's no point to them. So, so one of the most the, sort of the major examples which in the end drove me to write the book was around yeah. our attitude to drug policy and drug criminalization in particular. Uh, and, and I've done many, many huge drugs conspiracy cases, importation, you know, importation of, you know, tons of drugs at a time in some of those cases. And those cases, you know, whether you win or lose, I realize none of it makes any difference. If anything, it makes the drug problems in our society worse. Right. And yet we never say that to ourselves. When we when we're as lawyers, we're involved in these cases. You know, we just do the case that's presented to us. We defend our client or we prosecute the case based on the evidence. And we never say to ourselves, what's the point of this? And so I think from a sort of leadership perspective, what the, the, the most important question that I think leaders going into an organization should be asking is why? Why are we doing it this way? And if there's a good reason, a good answer, that's fine. But, the, but when I ask myself why we are running our criminal justice system the way we do, why we're obsessed with ever increasing prison populations, ever increasing sentences, which is we've seen in the United States, of course, over, over many decades yeah. and generations. Why do we do that when actually the consequences that we end up with a society that has more crime and more serious criminals and more criminals committing you know, repeat offenses? So, so the, the, the medicine that we choose for our society in, in the criminal justice system, which is my sort of principal yep. area of expertise, is actually making the patient sicker. And I think there are many organizations where the same applies, where there are procedures, there are policies, there are kind of established ways of doing things, which when someone actually stands back and says, okay, let's let, we know we do it that way, but why do we do it that way? 
and then people get answers that we do it this way because actually we've been doing it this way for 20 years not because it's the right thing to do and then once people are prepared to look at it that way rip it up and start again that's when you see real change and that's what i would like to see in the criminal justice system well see chris this is your insatiable curiosity coming out and i know we spoke a couple of weeks ago and you used a phrase that resonated with me was that we're hypnotized to the norm so tell yeah, us a little bit about that, how we are in some ways sleepwalking into doing things because it's always been done that way. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because I think one of the good examples around that is that is around football management and, and, and the fact that when you have an, an, a manager who's perhaps established with a side for a period of time, you often see after a period of time performance dropping off in the team. And, and then you see a new manager come in with a completely different approach with the same group of players suddenly achieving considerably yeah. better results that may not last but often you get that bounce from a, yeah. from a new leader coming in with a completely different approach you say we're not going to run the training that way i can see that this player is not you know we're not getting the best out of him because we're playing in the wrong position but the previous manager has got into habits which he or she believe were the right habits but ultimately didn't maximize the performance potential of the team and and you always get that sort of new manager new leader bounce and you see that in in the corporate world yep. and you see it in the legal world where you know where you can often see you know the law firms and so on that, that that take on a new lease of life when they come under new leadership so i think i think for me that kind of idea that we're hypnotized we're all hypnotized by the way things are done in our environment and we just become almost uh, passengers and once you're when you're a passenger no you're no longer driving the, the you know the business or driving the enterprise in any way you're just going in the direction of travel that's where things really start to go wrong and, and where you just don't have optimal performance you don't have optimal performance from your team you don't have optimal performance from the individuals within the team and most importantly of all you don't have optimal performance for the organization which is ultimately what all organizations are about how do we optimize how do we create the maximum efficiency, the maximum uh, outputs and the maximum profitability from the tools we have. And I think that hypnosis effect is one that people need to shake themselves out of in different ways by disruptive thinking, by bringing in occasional new bursts of fresh leadership and fresh thinking, mm -hmm. or in, as organizations do, and I work with organizations to do it, by bringing outside in perspective, by getting non-execs and not just having them come and drink tea every few months or, 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 or drink a glass of wine every three months, but come in and actually look at the business and say, hold on, why are you doing that? I don't understand it, why are you doing that? I've, and and I've, there are other organizations I've seen that do that much better. And so you get this kind of fertilization and cross fertilization from, from organizations by having people coming in in, in non-exec roles. And I think I think that the, the use of non-execs in organizations is a really, really important way to, to, to get that fresh infusion of thinking. So Chris, I know that you are a non-exec for one of the big accountancy firms. and. I hear you when you talk about the outside in, bring the outside in perspective. What do you think has been the main contribution that you have been able to bring to that role as a non-exec coming from the independent bar? Well, I think it's really, I, th I think the role that I that I that I fulfil on the financial services board of Grant Thornton is is an interesting one because it crosses over between my. I have a considerable amount of sort of financial services regulatory right. uh, experience in my in my legal practice, but I've also run businesses myself. I, you know, I, I started a financial services business as a startup, and it grew very significantly. And, and and eventually, I sold out to private equity some years ago. So I've actually taken startups in in that particular industry. Um, but I think the main thing is that as a non-exec, I'm not I'm not I don't have a boss as such. I don't have anyone. Uh, you know, organizations like Grant Thornton and like, and, and like the big banks and like many sort of corporate organizations, you know, they have a, quite a hierarchical structure and often there is a lack of encouragement of real kind of creative lateral thinking, like really disruptive thinking, because nobody wants to sort of be seen to stepping on their boss's toes. And, and you know, and it's a really kind of difficult to, kind of management issue in organizations which are you know heavily regulated and often have a lot of uh, a lot of people who have been there a long time and kind of seen the way that the business works. So my job is to come in and say to even the most senior partners in the business, yep. you know, I don't think you should be going down that route. That That's not just commercially doesn't make sense to me. And here's why. And they can listen to that and they can choose to, to take it on board and and perhaps reframe their strategy or they could choose to say well, actually do you know what i think i think we're stress testing our approach and and it's interesting to hear that view but we're, we're committed to the way that we're already doing it but the point right. is they have the opportunity for a completely fresh perspective on something which may have become uh, an activity that, that that people are just not putting enough energy or creativity into
So, Chris, there are so many things dropping out of this already. It's the leader moving from passenger to driver. It's organizations and leaders making sure that they have a healthy balance of inside out and outside in, where you are the critical friend, you are the diversity of thought. As you say, you have no boss, so you're quite happy as well to say no or ask the question, why are you doing it that way? Um, I'd love to zone in on a specific example, if I may, and think about your book, Justice on Trial, where I know you talked about many things, whether it's kids and crime, prison, drugs, and you choose, but lock in on something that you focused on the book in relation to you thinking it needed to be broken as a as a hypnotized norm or a status quo because it's just it's just flawed so focus on one of those for me and use it as well, an it, example it, so the overarching theme of justice on trial is that we shouldn't just pigeonhole and judge people yep. perhaps for one action or or, or or in terms of their background but we need to kind of look at how we get the best out of people and how we can you know if people have fallen off the sort of the path if you like of of best practice and best behavior how we can get them back on it as quickly and as painlessly and as and as cost efficiently as possible yep. now you could, i could be talking about anything there but it, as it happens i'm talking about the criminal justice system so picking out of justice on trial um, there were three areas that i identified in the book as being the most broken parts of our system and the most in need of radical change right and in in short form they are that we should effectively as i say in the book we should close the prisons as we have them now so all of these large prisons with clanging gates and doors and balconies and people you know self-harming and committed suicide at large rates and many people with serious mental health problems we just need to stop doing all of that because the great majority of people in our prison system are, are not violent people. I think it's 69% of prisoners are non-violent. They've committed right. either a drug offense or a financial crime or, or something that isn't, it doesn't involve harming another, another person. And most of those people are seriously damaged themselves. And most of them don't need to be in prison to protect the public or to prevent future crime. So we right. need to get rid of most of them out of the prison system. Many of the others, including some who are in for, for relatively minor violent crimes, also don't need to be in prison and the prison environment makes them worse so again my argument is just if it's not working as it's not and it doesn't in the us where they have almost two and a half million in prison oh, yeah crazy they, isn't it utterly obsessed and addicted uh, by 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 using a prison as the sanction for almost everything um it doesn't work so stop doing it and, and that and so I, I go through and make and show why prisons where or societies where that we have high levels of uh, imprisonment and high levels of use of incarceration in particular of young people have some of the highest levels of crime and the highest levels of repeat offending so why keep doing it if it doesn't work and I apply the same logic to our utterly dysfunctional approach to drug policy right. which has been going on now for almost a century and certainly in earnest for over 50 years where we've had this really aggressive criminalization policy towards drug trafficking and and drug um, supply none of which reduces the amount of drug taking all of which increases the amount of crime associated with drugs so we're doing something that makes the problem works worse which makes people ill and kills people in huge numbers <coughs> um, and, and, and yet we carry on doing it. So my argument is, let's just stop. So Chris, I've got a question. We're talking about trying to unravel decades or centuries of doing things in a certain way. I come back to that hypnotized to the norm. And there will be a huge swathe of power brokers who believe that that is the right thing to do. How do you get heard? Uh, are you the lone voice? And how do you get heard? How do you start to be the change? when there is obviously so much resistance or, but we've always done it like this, Chris, how do you get heard? Well, it's a good point. Obviously publishing a book, particularly a book that's published by a sort of fairly um, um, well-known publisher, Bloomsbury, who, you know, yep. who published Harry Potter amongst other things, but you know, getting a book out into, into circulation and doing interviews and talking about these things in a way that makes people think about them and listen is, is, as, is as much as I can really do. I mean, one of the reasons I took such an extreme position in the book I talk, I talk about closing all prisons, legalizing all drugs and taking all children out of the criminal justice system. These are quite extreme sort of yeah. positions on one level. But the, one of the reasons I did that was because my kind of thinking was, if you're prepared to say the real extreme position with the ultimate objective, then those who are kind of somewhere towards the, the other end or perhaps sitting towards the middle, you might just pull them a little bit towards you. I'm gotcha. not gonna get you know buy-in politically 
to the idea of, of a 70, 80% reduction in our prison population, for example, overnight. But if you get people at thinking about the need for evidence-based approaches rather than emotional kind of traditional ways of doing things, then you have the opportunity perhaps to just make some change because I'm a big believer in incremental change. And I, I don't, I, again, come, same, same applies to organizations. I think a new leader coming in and immediately on day one saying, we're going to change everything that you do. It's all wrong. We need a completely new approach. Well, that's what I'm saying in the book about our criminal justice system. And I right. believe that. But I know you can't get buy into that absolute position. You have to take people on a journey with you. You have to you yeah. have to get people to accept at least the, the idea of reform and the idea of change. And once they do, then then you start seeing incremental change. And over time, hopefully, you can you can you can see major major change and major opportunity. So, Chris, in some ways, it's not having people drink from the fire hose too much too soon. But I think we spoke, didn't we, previously about marginal gains and small wins baby steps is that right yeah i mean that's that's not the way that i would like to do it ultimately oh, i'm a believer in sort of radical change but the my i'm a pragmatist yeah. uh, first and foremost i think pragmatism is a really important leadership quality because when leaders go into an organization uh, or into a situation and say right i want to get here within a month the, the, if that's completely unrealistic because you don't have the personnel, you don't have the resources, or you don't have, you know, you haven't won the hearts and minds to take yeah. them on the journey, it's going to be cause more problems, and it's going to cause, uh, it's going to actually achieve less because you're just going to have people entrench and resent the position you're taking. So, so the, the, the my sort of philosophy, as you say, is that you know if you can get people to to move in the right direction then you know once that starts to happen you need to give it more momentum and over time you reach that so you, you you make the point about incremental change we all know about dave brailsford and the yep. and that, you know the application of that philosophy to the the, the british cycling team um some years ago yes. you know just get 0.1 second a lap get 0.2 second a lap and then when you add all of those up over two to four year yeah. cycle of going up to an olympic suddenly it's a gold you're medal gold medals and so 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 that that approach i think is incredibly important it's important to me you're not going to suddenly be able to rip up everything all at once but what you can do every single day is make some small improvement in the way that you do things and, and i hope that that just by communicating and talking about criminal justice that just some of these ideas will start to percolate there are many people who campaign on these issues of course but often they don't get heard and, and if they do they get shouted down and so I think I, 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 you know, going on 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 in on media interviews and talking about these things in a in a calm and rational way and a pragmatic way without emotion, I think hopefully will will we'll persuade at least some people that we need to start making movement in the right direction. Well, as you say, it gets the debate started, doesn't it? And you've got to be courageous enough sometimes to be the lone voice, uh, to be the disruptor in order to try and get the change to actually happen. Chris, I've got a question for you. What's kind of been the, the biggest learning for you over the last few years as you've embarked on uh, on this course of suggesting quite dramatic change on some seismic issues? What's been the biggest learning for you? I think I think the biggest learning has been, you know, the re, you know, the realization that the system in which I've spent most of my working life over almost three decades is yep. so fundamentally broken. And I, I think that's that, you know, whilst that's a sad re realization on one level, because, you know, I'm asking myself, what's the point of all the work I've done all the, these years? Mm. You know, because actually what's changed? I mean, since I started in, in legal practice in the 1990s, our prison population doubled from about 40,000 to about 80,000. So the system throughout the whole time I've been working in it, in, on, by, by most rational calculations, has actually got worse. And I think, but so that on one level is a fairly negative realization. But then with that comes the ability to say, okay, well, if there are all these mistakes, then we're, but we are all capable of making some incremental difference to make it slightly better. And, and, and so I've tried to apply some of that to the way in which I conduct cases, mm -hmm. the way in which I deal with clients. And in particular, I think it's the most important lesson I learned, which we kind of we spoke about a couple of minutes ago, is, is the need to be pragmatic, to deal with what you have and to achieve the optimal outcome that you can, not to try and always achieve perfection or always achieve the ideal, because it's not always possible. But you can always make something better uh, by, by applying yourself in the, in the right way. Well, there's the trial lawyer in you as well, <laughs> for sure. Um, so let me ask you to help me 
try and bring uh, so many lessons have, have come out of this already try and bring this across now to people who are listening and they're thinking about themselves as leaders of themselves as themselves as leaders of others and leading organizations what are some of the, the you think the the two or three big key takeaways that they can take out of your experience for them as leaders what would you say okay so i think my number one is don't assume that you're right just okay. because you're in the leadership role just because that you know you have chief exec on your business cards or yep. whatever it might be just because you are, ha have the the most senior title don't assume that you're always right so one of the things that i always do uh, when i'm leading a case particularly a fairly large case with a fairly large legal team is i always make sure i get input from everyone so so i mean often i go into meetings you know where there are junior solicitors or yes. people barristers or other junior junior members of the team and i and I, you know when i was uh, sort of younger and in those more junior roles no one would ever speak to me. It was as if right. you weren't there. Um, and so, uh, and yet, <laughs> the number of times that I've sat in recent years in, in, in those situations and, and asked the trainee solicitor or, or the most junior person in the room, what do you think about it? And they're often shocked to be asked to have an opinion at all. But once they're given the opportunity, they'll come out with something that no one else has said. Because, because they because they don't think in the same established and entrenched way because they have a they, they're new to it they may have some knowledge of, of of the process and they have some knowledge of the subject matter that you're talking about but they don't have an entrenched view that it must be done a certain way whereas yes. most people in the room tend to do so i think as a leader it's really really important not to assume that you're right just because you may instinctively strongly and very quickly come to a view as to what the right thing to do is and i see uh, one of the sort of leadership flaws i see is just that leaders going into a room saying this is what we're going to do don't want to listen to anything else this is this is the approach so be yeah. prepared to listen and, and and have the the maturity and and i think the highest quality leadership skill is the ability to turn to a group and say i originally thought this i'm persuaded that we need to go another way and i think it's really important that such and such a person was willing to come out and say that and and we're going to actually slightly reframe the strategy that i had in mind and it's going to be better mm. so I, I think that that willingness to kind of put yourself uh, it, you know, stand back a bit from your position and your title and just look at what will work rather than whose idea it was uh, or, 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 you know, how strongly people feel. And I think that's, that's really important in, 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 in the commercial world because I think we still in many parts of, of the commercial sector and, and the legal sector for that matter, um, we, you know, may, we have male dominance. You know, there's a lot yes. of male dominance in, in, in senior leadership roles and in senior executive teams. And I think that women often communicate uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, they, they tend to be more pragmatic, tend to be on average more conciliatory. So I think it's really important that male leaders don't assume that the sort of the male approach, often quite domineering uh, and, and highly self-confident, is necessarily the best one. Just take, take you know, make sure that the whole team gets the opportunity opportunity to have input um, and, and do what the best thing is in the end, but be prepared to make to, to say that it's not the thing I originally thought it was. You know, Chris, we're, we're talking about diversity of thought again, aren't we? And I, I was writing down uh, some words as you were chatting and, and talking me through that, you know, a leader to be courageous, to be inclusive, to be humble. And also there's an element of vulnerability there as well to say, I don't have all of the answers or I thought I had the answer. I may be wrong. What, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you think? And I think that's also incredibly important for leaders as we come out of a pandemic. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think I think we, you know, you're dealing with a, a fairly fragile workforce in many environments, mentally oh, yeah. fragile, emotionally fragile as a result of the last 18 months or so. Yep. And so you're dealing with, you know, leaders also have to be astute to, to that, to that dynamic. They have to be aware that there are vulnerabilities amongst their their staff, even their more senior staff, that they may believe were incredibly robust. Uh, may in fact be less so. So I, th I think kind of acknowledging that, I mean, I've, I've done some stuff recently talking about the need for organisations to have a, a really uh, kind of creative approach to work practices and work patterns. Uh, you know, people, uh, organisations, I know of organisations that are pushing really hard to just get everybody back in the office, return to what was considered business as usual 18 months ago before the pandemic. But actually, my view is that that's a really big mistake, because that's exactly that's the exact mistake that I'm saying we'd be making in our criminal justice system all these years, so just assuming that the way it was done and has been done must have been right, because it went on for a long time, when actually, you know, the pandemic gives an enormous opportunity. I mean, it's been a terrible and tragic kind of impact on our on our world and our society but it also gives the opportunity to say okay well we managed to do things in a very different way for the last mm -hmm. 18 months 
in some organizations, in fact, more successfully than they were doing before. And so if that's the case, then we need to make sure that we don't lose the, 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 the best that's come out of this incredibly hard period. I mean, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, um, one of the reasons why you know, the human species and indeed other species are successful is a willingness to go and do something slightly different to everybody else that's gone before. That's how evolution works. You know, suddenly one, one you know, bear starts fishing in a river and catching salmon, and then it, it has a huge evolutionary advantage. And therefore, you know, many others start to adopt that practice and they become the most successful of their, of their kind. So I think in business, it's that willingness to be the one that's the first one to dip your hand in the river and try and catch a salmon. Um, you know, and, and in this period of time, many people have had no choice. You know, you've had yep. to had to create totally different radically different ways of conducting your affairs and of running your company or running your running your organization and you know if if some of those have been really successful and have created efficiencies and new profit centers then don't don't lose them and just go back to the old ways keep them with us and adapt and move on and the organizations that do make the most of the opportunities that have come about in the last 18 months whether it's process opportunities or broad commercial opportunities to make more money either of those things efficiency opportunities and so on just use them all use all the all of those different things which are which which have all um we've all had to kind of create be creative around in a way that i don't think we've seen before for generations i mean i can't think of an of an occasion when there's had to be so much adaptation by so many people to such a challenging situation and yet so many organizations leaders in particular haven't yep. managed to survive so let's just make the most of all of that well in some ways let's make the most of a good crisis and we're Absolutely. not quite out of that crisis um chris I, I would love to chat to you for longer but i also want to ask how can people get in uh contact with you so maybe continue the conversation be part of the conversation that you're you're having at the moment is there a way that they can connect I'm very active on LinkedIn and yep. on Twitter in particular. Uh, LinkedIn, I kind of use for more broad kind of management um, and more kind of uh, business business orientated content. And Twitter is much more political and tends to be around the, the sort of criminal justice campaigning. So but if people are interested in, in that side of things, of course, they can read the book, Justice on Trial. Yep. Uh, they can watch the TV show on BBC iPlayer, Crime Are We Tough Enough, which is a five episode series yes. which went out on BBC One last year. Um, and, and they can follow me on Twitter at Crimlaw UK uh, or, or by all means, you know, uh, follow on LinkedIn and, and see if they like some of the content where I do talk about leadership. And, you know, in fact, one of the things I was talking about on LinkedIn recently was was this 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 point about uh, learning, you know, from COVID and being prepared to, to, to let employees and, 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 and people in the organization work in a very different way. Because those I, I said that those that fail to adapt to the lessons of COVID or learn the lessons of COVID will fail. Yeah, well, it's adapt or die, isn't it, Chris? And in some ways, for senior and experienced leaders, one of the most difficult things for them to do, I think, is to unlearn before they might oh. learn again and to get rid of yeah. some of those bad habits. And I've always done it like this, but actually, that's just not going to take me forward. No, and that's why leaders should endeavour, where possible, to have non-exec roles in other organisations if, right. if that's possible. Because if you think about it, not, not only is there a sort of that outside-in perspective where you bring NEDs into your organisation to kind of give you that outside perspective, but also taking your senior leaders and saying, go into another organisation. It might be a, a voluntary organisation or it might be another commercial organisation, but go in as an NED and you'll, you'll, you'll find that there's lots of different things that, that, that other organisations do differently to your organisation. And you could learn from that and bring it back again. Yep. So you, just, you know, it's a virtue, a virtuous circle where where, you, where you're going out to other organisations and you're bringing outsiders in. Um, all of that, I think, that cross fertilisation again, it goes back to evolution. That's how evolution works. You know, it's cross fertilisation. It's diversity, and the more diverse the thinking, the more diverse the the group of people that you have working with you or for you, um, the more successful you're going to be. Uh, Chris, I couldn't agree more. I've got a final question for you, uh, if I may, and it's this. What's the most poignant piece of leadership advice you've ever given or received? Um, I think that's, a, in terms of poignant, that's, that's, um, that's quite a difficult one, because I think in terms of sort of leadership, um, you know, poignancy is something I don't, I don't often think about as being uh, as being much of a factor i think it's more it's more the question of sort of humbling i think i mean yeah well, what's, what's front of mind for you 
Yeah, so front of mind in, ter in, in terms of, you know, um, uh, in terms of lessons that I've learned, I think um, those, who, those who are the most sensitive to the feelings of other people, I think empathy uh, as, as, a, as a trait and a quality yeah. is really, really important for a leader. So that, and I, and I think, you know, I've, I've had many, um, many, uh, you know, senior lawyers who I've worked with, um, particularly QCs when I was in junior practice, who, 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 would, who would say, yeah, but you're not thinking about it from that person's point of view. You're not you're not thinking about it from you know when you're looking at for example how to cross examine a witness is something yeah. that we do quite commonly in our line of work. If you if you can't empathise with the witness, you can't really understand where they're coming from or why they might be reluctant to say certain things. You're going to be much worse at doing your job. And and the same applies to to, to you know leaders of teams. You know if you don't really know your people, you don't know what makes them tick, and you can't really see why they may have a reluctance to do things a certain way or why they may have an, an appetite to do them another way then you won't be able to make the best of them so so i think the most important quality that i have um and, and it's one that's you know partly you know built in some of us are empathetic by nature but partly sort of drilled in as a result of many years of, of of working in high pressure legal environments where there's much at stake uh, but that but but the but the willingness and the ability to understand the needs and concerns of others uh, i think is the most important uh, quality of a good leader which ties in very neatly with uh, the work that I'm doing as regards human centered leadership. So that was a lovely segue. <laughs> so Chris, it's been absolutely great to have you on the show. I appreciate you giving up the time. Uh, and I hope maybe we'll come back to you as well, maybe after your next book, or we'll get an update for you about how you're actually doing on some of the, uh, the challenges uh, that you're taking on. But thanks so much for being a great guest on the Leadership Enigma. Thanks, Adam. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.